Module 4, The Leadership of Susan B. Anthony. We're reading The Hope Chest by Karen Schwabach, Chapters 4 and 5. Background Information for Chapter 4. Settlement House. It housed young American college graduates who moved into inner city neighborhoods for the purpose of discovering the needs of and providing services to local residents. Homework. Read chapters four and five, then record summary notes in the left box at the bottom of the reader's guide for both chapters. Chapter four, Henry Street. Page 42, chapter four, Henry Street. The Henry Street Settlement House had stone steps with wrought iron railings. At the bottom of the steps sat a group of girls playing jacks and a woman rocking a baby in a baby carriage with her foot. Violet followed Myrtle up the steps to a heavy wooden door. I think we just go in, said Myrtle. Violet had a lifelong training in good manners, and it did not include going into other people's houses without knocking. She hesitated, but Myrtle pushed the door open and went in. Violet followed her with some trepidation. The house had an ordinary hall with a carpet and an umbrella stand. Upstairs, some people were singing. Violet couldn't understand the words. They were in a foreign language. Violet looked questioningly at Mar Myrtle. Myrtle shrugged. I've never been inside here before, she said. Page 43. Violet went over to one of the doors and tentatively pushed it open. It was a parlor, rather like the one back home had been before it was turned into Stephen's recuperation room. There were some bookshelves, a mahogany table, and a sofa, and some armchairs covered in red velvet. A man was sitting in one of the chairs, absorbed in a book. He had a thin, harried look as if he hadn't gotten enough sleep in several years. Violet stepped hesitantly into the room. She could feel Myrtle following just behind her. Excuse me, she began. The man started, although Violet noticed he closed the book on his hand to keep from losing his place, just as she would have done. Good evening, ladies. The man stood up as if Violet and Myrtle were in fact ladies. How do you do? Very well, thank you, Violet curtsied, and Myrtle did the same. All this politeness was such a waste of time. She just wanted to see her sister. I was wondering if you might know where I can find Miss Chloe Mayhew. As soon as she said Chloe's name, the man dropped the book. He bent to pick it up, examining it carefully for damage. Violet wondered if he was going to answer her. She studied him while he wasn't looking. He was about as tall as father, nearly six feet, but much thinner, and was wearing a ready-made brown suit and a soft-collared shirt that father wouldn't have been caught dead in. In fact, Violet wasn't sure she'd ever seen a man out in public. Turn the page. Page 44. In fact, Violet wasn't sure she'd ever seen a man out in public in a soft-collared shirt. He had light brown hair that was just a little longer than it should have been, but the strangest thing about his face was an angry white scar that ran from the corner of his left eye down into his bushy mustache. Violet found it difficult to keep her eyes off of it, though of course she knew that good manners required her to do so. Finally, he decided the book wasn't damaged. I hope you ladies won't think me discourteous if I express some curiosity as to who might be inquiring for Miss Mayhew, he said. Won't you please be seated? Violet sat down on the edge of the sofa that the man indicated. The cushion creaked as Myrtle sat down beside her. Violet wanted him to hurry up and go find Chloe for her, but of course it wouldn't be polite to say so, and Violet could see that this man was very polite. He spoke in the polite way that boys had to talk to the girls at the dancing school that Mother made Violet go to, but unlike the boys at dancing school, he seemed quite comfortable doing it. Violet glanced at Myrtle, wondering what she was making of the stranger. Myrtle raised her eyebrows in a sort of facial sh shrug, I'm Miss Violet Mayhew, said Violet to the man. I'm Miss Mayhew's sister. And this is Myrtle, um, she'd forgotten Myrtle's last name. Davies, said Myrtle. And I am Theo Martin, said the man, sitting down. Page 45. It's a pleasure to meet you. He clasped his book between his thumb and forefinger, and Violet realized with surprise that those were the only two fingers he had on his right hand. She looked quickly away and saw Myrtle try not to notice the missing fingers as well. "'I'm afraid Miss Mayhew isn't here,' said Mr. Martin. 
She isn't in New York, actually. Violet felt as if she'd just been punched in the stomach. That Chloe wouldn't be in New York was a possibility that hadn't occurred to her. But I have letters, she protested, starting to reach for them, and then remembering that they were in her bloomers. Not really a place you could reach for in a public parlor. I thought she lived here. She could feel tears starting in her eyes and fought valiantly to keep them from spilling out. A lady never cried in public. She felt someone touch her, and looked with surprise to see Myrtle's hand resting on her arm. Mr. Martin leaned forward, looking concerned. "'I'm sure your sister is in excellent health, Miss Mayhew. She's simply not in New York. Please don't worry.' Violet tried to smile, to reassure him, and accidentally jarred one of the tears loose. It trickled down beside her nose. She went to Washington, D.C. over a year ago to work with the National Women's Party, on the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. She drove off in that alarming machine of hers. He smiled fondly. Clo, Miss... Turn the page. Page 46. Clo, Miss Mayhew said that she loved nursing, but that winning the vote for women was more important right now. Violet had managed to get control of her tears. Chloe's been a suffragist ever since she was in high school, she said. Even then, she worked on petitions and things. Well, it's a very worthwhile cause, said Mr. Martin. Violet looked at him, surprised. You think so? Of course. Denying equal suffrage to women is a terrible injustice. Violet was astonished. She had heard people say this before, Chloe chief among them, but she'd never heard a man say it. She hadn't really thought a man could want vote for women. Father certainly didn't and none of the men from the bank that he invited for dinner, Mr. Russell and Mr. Rice and Mr. all the rest of them did. As for Stephen, she hadn't really known Stephen that well. He'd been away since she was little, first at Cornell University and then at the war. For the last three years he hadn't voiced any opinions, even though father had made mother dress him up so he could take him to the polls to vote on election day just the same. My father says a woman's suffrage is a damn fool crazy idea, Violet blurted, then clapped her hand to her mouth. I beg your pardon. Mr. Martin smiled. Every great advance in human society started out as a damn fool crazy idea. Er, yes, said Violet, feeling the conversation was getting off track. Page 47. Myrtle apparently thought so too, because she said, do you have an address for Miss Mayhew in Washington, sir? An address? No, wait a minute. Mr. Martin put his book down. Are you in New York with your parents, Miss Mayhew? And what about you, Miss Davies? Where have you sprung from? And don't they miss you there? Violet and Myrtle glanced at each other alarmed. Mr. Martin had been speaking so normally that Violet, at least, had forgotten that he was an adult and likely to be interested in these sorts of details. She was trying to think of an evasive answer to this while still not looking at Mr. Martin's missing fingers or a scar when Myrtle said, She just wants an address to write to, I think, Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin still looked suspicious, so Violet hastily agreed. Yes, just to write to. My father and mother don't, that is, they and Chloe had an argument. Mr. Martin frowned. And you, Miss Davies? The door opened inward halfway, and a woman's voice called, Theo, come help me get these boys out of the chimney. Excuse me, said Mr. Martin, standing up again. I'll be just a minute. Please wait right here. As soon as he left the room, Violet said, We'd better go, at exactly the same moment that Myrtle whispered, Let's get out of here. Violet smiled in spite of her anxiety. She and Flossie used to say the same thing at the same time, too. She turned the page. Page 48. She looked out into the hallway. There was no sign of Mr. Martin or anyone else. They rushed out the front door, careful not to slam it behind them. When they were out on, in the street again, Myrtle said, That Mr. Martin was going to trot me over to the Institute and then put you on the first train back to Pennsylvania. What are you going to do now? Should we go to Washington to find your sister? Violet had been thinking just that, though she had no idea how to get there. Don't you have to go back to your training institute? I told you, I try not to spend too much time there. 
but don't they want you there? Violet still wasn't sure exactly what a girls' training institute was, but if it was anything like school, they would. Yes, said Myrtle, unconcernedly. Do you have enough money for the train to D.C.? I don't think so, said Violet. How far is it? A long way, said Myrtle. More than two hundred miles. Violet didn't have to do the math. At two cents a mile, she did not have enough money. How will I get there? We'll find a way, said Myrtle. Let's go to the train station and see what we can figure out. But what about your school? Violet persisted. She couldn't believe Myrtle was just going to wander away. It isn't a school, said Myrtle testily. It's a training institute. A school would be a place where you learn stuff from books so that you could do something important in the world. My mama sent me to a school when she was alive. She didn't want me to go someplace where we study ironing and dusting and knowing our place. Mama didn't for me, mean for me to know my place. Ver Myrtle had started out the speech sounding cranky, but at the end there was a dangerous squeak in her voice, and Violet was afraid she was going to start crying. She never knew what to do when people started crying. Fortunately, Myrtle didn't. Come on, Myrtle said. Let's go to the train station. End of chapter four. Chapter five, Hobie and the Brakeman. Background information for chapter five. Hobo jungles, camps where homeless travelers in the early 1900s stayed. Riding the rails, which was taking trains without pain. Angelina's, the hobo term for a young girl. Steam locomotive, a train that produces its power through a steam engine. Burning coal, wood, or oil produced steam in a boiler, which made the engine work. Men often had to shovel either wood or coal into the boiler to keep the fire burning, which was a dirty and back-breaking job. Page 50, Chapter 5, Hobie and the Brakeman they would never have gotten to Washington if Hobie the hobo hadn't showed them how to frisk a head-end blind. He was about Violet's age, she was sure. He wore knee breeches and the same sort of ankle-high black boots that Myrtle and Violet had, but his face wore a studied expression of world weariness that made him look at least forty. He had a plug of tobacco fixed firmly in his left cheek and talked around it in fluent hobo slang. Angelina's looking to catch a blind? he said to Violet and Myr as Violet and Myrtle stood on the platform in Penn Station, wondering what their chances were of boarding a train without tickets and not being caught. What? said Myrtle. Page 51. Are you blind baggage? he said. Er, I don't think so, said Violet firmly, in an attempt to end the conversation. Hobie looked exactly like the wrong sort of person that her mother was always talking about. Too bad. You should be. If you want to make the miles. Hop in the freights is for rubes, said the boy. Too slow. Even if you get on a 500 miler, who wants to spend all their time on the drag line? And you can get your legs sliced off riding the rods. You gotta ride the blinds. You want to make any miles. Violet moved away. But to her distress, Myrtle was looking at the boy with interest. Can you get us onto a train? Myrtle asked. Thought you'd never ask, Angelina. Name's Hobie. Hobie the hobo, he extended his hand. Myrtle shook it. Then he stuck his hand at Violet. She wanted nothing to do with this boy, but she was too polite not to take his hand and shake it. His hand felt rough and calloused. A lot of the brothers and sisters of the road won't come into the big burg, Hobie said. Too many bulls in New York. But it ain't hard if you stay away from the freight yards and know how to catch a blind. We need to get to Washington, said Myrtle. Can you show us how? Washington. Hobie swept his hair back from his forehead and rocked back on his heels, thinking, Gonna turn the page. Page 52. Gonna catch the bum zone, then the ma and pa. Those are railroads, he added. Gonna change in Philly and Baltimore. Stay off the hot boxes unless you catch a hot shot. Uh, you Angelinas don't know anything about riding the rails, do you? No, nothing, said Myrtle. But it soon became clear that Hobie knew everything at least about hoboing, and that he intended to tell it to them. As he talked, Violet drew Myrtle aside and tried to whisper that they needed to lose Hobie quickly. 
Myrtle wouldn't even let her start. He's going to help us out, she said, shrugging by a little way. Violet was annoyed. She didn't want to be thought a coward. She liked that Myrtle was a person who was willing to just take off and do something, like leave her school, institute, and go to Washington. It reminded her a little of Flossie, who was always ready to try something new without a whole lot of discussion and worrying and planning. Violet wondered if she'd changed so much since Flossie's death that she'd become a worrier and a fraidy cat that Vi Flossie wouldn't even like anymore. It was a horrible thought. She listened to what Hopi was telling them. To be blind baggage meant riding in the blind spot between the engine and the baggage car of a passenger train. The trick was to duck in just after the highball, the two short blasts on the whistle that meant that the train was about to leave, and after the conductors had all stepped onto the train. Page 53. When the blast came, Hobie grabbed them each by a hand and darted onto the steel platform behind the engine so quickly the Violet caught her foot on the edge, stumbled, and almost fell onto the tracks. Hobie grabbed the collar of her midi blouse and pulled her back. Steady, Angelina, he said. They sat facing backward on account of the cinders, which flew back from the smokestack as the train gained speed and filled the air with the smell of coal smoke. Violet and Myrtle sat huddled together, trying not to look at the ground whizzing by beneath them. The train jolted about as it picked up speed, and there was nothing to hold on to. The platform had no walls. One good jolt, Violet thought, and all three of them would fly off into the landscape that was zipping past. Hobie was unperturbed. He leaned back and told them about his adventures. He was twelve, year old, twelve years old, he admitted, and had been riding the rails on and off for two years. Where do you come from? Myrtle asked. Tennessee. Copper Hill, Tennessee. Up in the Blue Ridge. But there ain't hardly nobody. Nowhere I ain't been, Hobie bragged. Been all over Hope Bohemia. He swept his arm to indicate the scenery they were passing, which they couldn't see very well because they were squinting to keep the cinders out of their eyes. It seemed to go on forever. What if she just stayed home, Violet thought. What should, would she be doing right now? It was night. She would have already read to turn the page. Page 54. She would have already read to Stephen. Dinner would be over, including the nightly endurance of table manners and impossible rules, like eating everything on your plate, even horrible, grisly, fat pieces of meat, or you'd have to eat it for breakfast tomorrow. She'd be alone in her room, in her bed, under the green chenille bedspread, rereading one of her Oz books by the bedside lamp. Instead, she was hunched over on the vibrating iron platform, breathing smoke and nearly deafened by the clatter of wheels on rails, so she could hardly hear Hobie. He seemed to be saying that he didn't need to go to school because he was going to be educated at some hobo college that some rich man was starting. It must have been nearly midnight, Violet guessed, when they reached Philadelphia. They walked across numerous tracks to a freight yard. We can catch a fast freight from here to Baltimore, Hobie said, but it ain't here yet. I'm going over to the jungle to get some hobo stew. He indicated a clump of trees from which a thin column of smoke was rising. Violet and Myrtle started to follow him, but he held up a hand to stop them. No, you Angelina stay here. This is a bad jungle. Too many of the Johnson family, you know what I mean? Too many profesh. I, I guess he means criminals. Violet stopped and looked at Myrtle. Oh, no. Do I look as bad as you do? Probably, said Myrtle, if I look that bad. You do, Violet assured her. Myrtle looked as though she'd taken a bath in charcoal. Page 55. Her dress was no longer blue and white striped, but coal smoke black, and her formerly white mob cap and apron matched. They sat down on the gravel of the roadbed. It was very uncomfortable. Violet wondered if there was anywhere nearby where they could buy something to eat, anywhere that wouldn't mind serving people who looked like they'd been swept out of the bottom of a fireplace, and if any place was even open at this hour. What time do you think it is? Violet asked. Myrtle shrugged. Really late. I think it was around ten at night when we left New York. Hobie brought them two tin cans full of what he said was stew. Violet was too hungry to be particular. They drank and ate the stew as best they could with their grimy fingers. 
It was full of vegetables Violet didn't recognize, and bits of meat it was best not to examine too closely, but it tasted all right. We'll sleep here tonight, said Hobie, but not in the jungle. I didn't tell the yeggs you were here. Some of them don't know how to act proper around ladies. We'll sleep over there in one of them broke-down cars. There's a through freight to Baltimore tomorrow. So that is what they did. Hobie told them more of his adventures as they fell asleep under a covering of newspapers on a wheelless flat car. Violet looked up at the stars and wondered if she really would see Chloe tomorrow. When the newspapers fluttered and rustled in, turn the page. Page 56. When the newspapers fluttered and rustled in the breeze, she thought about her green chenille bedspread, but she didn't wish she was back in Susquehanna. She was having an adventure, and Myrtle was a good person to have an adventure with, just like Flossie would have been. It was funny, but Violet felt as if there was some part of her that had been locked up since Flossie's death, even more locked up than the rest of her was, and that was being set free. As for Hobie, she was getting used to him. The main thing was not to look at him directly so that you didn't have to realize he was just a kid when he kept talking like he was his own grandfather. As Violet drifted off sleep, Hobie was talking about how he wanted to go to Florida, one of the few places he admitted he'd never been. It had been easy for Myrtle to decide to leave the girls' training institute in New York. In her mind, she'd left it the moment she arrived, a year ago, when she was nine. Myrtle didn't know where her life was going to take her, but she was ready for it to take her somewhere else, and she didn't intend to be anybody's maid. Myrtle wasn't tough like Hobie, but she wasn't soft like Violet either. Still, she woke up in the morning stiff and achy. The rough wooden floor of the flat car was even less comfortable than the lumpy cots at the girls' training institute, which were said to be left over from the Civil War. She and Violet ate some stale doughnuts Hobie brought from the jungle and drank bitter, chicory coffee from tin cans. Page 57. Violet made a face over the coffee. And when Myrtle asked her if she'd never had chicory coffee before, she admitted she'd never had coffee before at all. Hobie was wrong about one thing. Boxcars were a lot more comfortable than riding the blinds. They rode in a deadhead, an empty boxcar, on the through freight to Baltimore. When they got to Baltimore, the railroad police, whom Hobie called bulls, chased them away from the blinds so that they had to take another freight. They were jouncing along in an empty boxcar, sitting on the wooden floor, watching tobacco fields pass by, and listening to Hobie talk about the Rocky Mountains, when there was a loud wooden thump, and a white man in blue coverall landed on the boards in front of them. Myrtle leapt to her feet and backed away from him. His hands were balled into tight fists, and he advanced on them menacingly. Stealing rides, eh? Should I turn you into the bulls or just throw you off the train? Hobie got to his feet and folded his arms. It's your train, is it? It sure ain't yours, said the man. So what's it going to be? Do I ditch you or are you ready to throw? I don't have any money, said Hobie defiantly, so ditch me. The man clearly didn't like this idea. How about one of the Angelinas then? He reached out and grabbed Myrtle. He stank of sweat and soot. Myrtle struggled. His turn the page. Page 58. His hand dug painfully into her arm. He lifted her into the air and grabbed her ankle in his other hand. The floor and the walls lurched crazily past, and Myrtle couldn't catch her breath to scream. He swung her. He was going to throw her out the open door. You ready to see her hit the grit? The white man's voice seemed to lurch, too. He swung Myrtle again. She saw the ground whizzing beneath her, terrifyingly close and fast. I have money! Violet screamed. Myrtle saw a flash of grubby pink skin as Violet tried to grab the man's arm. I have money! Put her down! Right now! The man set Myrtle down, jarringly. If he hadn't been gripping her arms tight behind her, she would have fallen. Make me the hike, then, he ordered. Violet scrabbled in her blouse and drew out a pinned handkerchief. She'd started to hand it over when Hobie grabbed her arm. Don't, he said. Are you crazy? Violet snapped. Fifteen cents, Hobie said. He gets fifteen cents. Thirty, said the criminal, twisting Myrtle's arms a few inches for emphasis. 
It hurt horribly. Myrtle felt dizzy with pain. She saw Violet wince with sympathy. Fifteen, said Hobie. That's the hike. Ten cents per hundred miles, said the criminal. Each. We ain't going no hundred miles, said Hobie. We're going to Washington, and that ain't but half that. Give him fifteen, Angelina. Myrtle couldn't believe he was arguing about money with this madman. Violet handed the criminal three nickels. He grabbed them and let Myrtle go with a kind of disgusted shove. She fell on the floorboards. Are you all right? Myrtle felt Violet's hands on her arms. Myrtle, say something. Myrtle didn't want to say anything, because she thought if she opened her mouth, she might be sick. She wasn't normally a person to get dizzy easily, but then nobody had ever swung her out the open door of a moving train before. When she could see clearly again, the man was gone. Hobie looked after him philosophically. Don't think he's been a brakeman too long, that fella. You hardly ever see a brakey who's still got both hands. A brakeman? Violet stared at Hobie. You mean that criminal works for the railroad? Yup, said Hobie, casting a disgusted look out the open door. How, how did he get in here? Myrtle asked, shakily. Roof, said Hobie, nodding upward. Brakeys can climb all over the outside of a moving train. Doesn't bother them none. I would th think, said Violet, who Myrtle saw was starting to tremble now, that they would fall off. Oh, they do, all the time. Die like flies, said Hobie. Turn the page. Page 60. They're not all like that, he added fairly. Most of them don't care if the brothers and sisters want to grab an armload of boxcars. Myrtle had gotten used to Hobie's talk enough to figure out that was another way to say, catch a ride. It was evening when they arrived in Washington. When they got off the train in Washington, Hobie stayed on it. I think I'm going to ride this as far as it goes, he said. Might make it to Florida. He seemed to have no interest in actually being in any of the places that trains went to, Myrtle thought, but only in getting to them. Myrtle had met kids like Hobie before. New York was full of them grown-up kids who had been out on their own for years. She didn't really blame Hobie for being tough enough to argue with a brakeman who was threatening to throw her out of a train. Toughness is what kept such kids alive. But the next thing he said shocked her. There's bound to be a lot of brakemen between Washington and Florida, Violet said. She reached for her pinned-up handkerchief of money and tried to give it to Hobie. He wouldn't take it. I have money, he said. You what? Myrtle squawked. You have money? You were going to let that brakeman throw Myrtle out of the train when you had money to pay him with? Violet demanded. No, of course I wasn't, said Hobie. He did not elaborate. You Angelinas take care now. Page 61. Myrtle didn't know whether to believe him or not, about the money and about whether he would have let the brakeman throw her off the train. She decided she had to believe he wouldn't have. The alternative was too awful. She took a deep breath. You take care too, Hobie, she said. Yes, and thank you, said Violet. They waved to him as the train pulled out. End of chapter five. Homework. Read chapters four and five, then record summary notes in the left box at the bottom of the reader's guide for both chapters. Let's review how to fill out the Somebody In Wanted But So Then summary notes. The somebody is the character or the narrator in a text. In is the place where the text is set. Wanted is what the character or the narrator is hoping for. But is the problem or the obstacle that might get in the way of what the narrator or the character wants. So is the outcome or resolution. And then is what happens to move the story forward. Now the somebody in this chapter is actually two somebodies. It's Violet and Myrtle. In New York City. Okay, I want you to fill out the next part on your own. What is it that Violet wanted? What is it that Myrtle is helping Violet do?
Okay, you should have filled out that they wanted to find Chloe, Violet's sister, and they'd gone to the Henry Street house to find her. But they find out from a man when at the Henry Street house that Chloe has gone to Washington, D.C. to be part of the women's suffrage movement. So that's what you're going to enter for the but. And while they're finding this information out, Mr. Martin starts to ask them questions about who they are and where they're supposed to be. That's what we're going to enter for the so. And then I want you to fill out the last box, the then. What happens after Mr. Martin starts asking them those questions? What do Violet and Myrtle decide to do? Pause the video if you need more time to complete the work on your homework. The somebody in this chapter is again Violet and Myrtle. Now they are in a train station in New York City. I want you to complete the next box. What is it they wanted? Why were they at the train station in New York City? Take the time to fill this in on your own. The but is the obstacle or the problem that's standing in their way. So what's keeping them from being able to take the train? Fill that in in the space labeled but. So what was the solution to their problem? I want you to go ahead and fill in part of this answer. I will tell you that it part of the solution has to do with Hobie, who is the 12 year old hobo who knows all about riding the rails. What is it that he helps them do? Fill in the blank for so. Make sure you're writing down everything that's on the screen and more in your reader's guide. Then something else happens in the story. There is a criminal called a brakeman and I want you to fill in the rest with what happens when that character comes into the scene. Pause the video if you need more time to complete the work on your homework. End of chapters 4 and 5